Our work to support local election officials, monitor local election workers, and protect voting rights is a time-honored tradition in League. Here to assist us in recognizing how best to focus our forces this year are representatives of some of our longtime partners in the fight to ensure that our elections are free, fair, and accessible to every eligible voter. First, we have Kristen Clark, the President and Executive Director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law. Most of us are very familiar with the Lawyers Committee and the critical support the committee provides to voters on Election Day, as well as the landmark effort a couple of years ago to gather real data and real evidence in support of the Voting Rights Act. Kristen has also served as the head of the Civil Rights Bureau of the New York State Attorney General, uh, General's Office, as well as serving with the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund. Also joining us is Arturo Vargas, Executive Director of NELEO, uh, the, a national organization that strengthens American democracy by promoting full participation of Latinos in civic life. He also serves as Executive Director of, um, the Nation, of NELEO Educational Fund. Uh, fund. Finally, we have Christine Chen, the founding and current executive director of, is it APIA Vote? API Vote. API Vote, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's because I have this in all caps that I'm struggling. <laughs> API Vote's research and polling of Asian American voters and their regional trainers, trainings and field programs have strengthened the local grassroots programs in reaching and mobilizing Asian American and Pacific Islander voters. Christine also serves as president of Strategic Alliances USA, a consulting firm specializing in coalition building, institutional development, and partnerships among the corporate sector, government agencies, and the nonprofit and public center. Um, I'm going to start. Let, I'm going to let Kristen start. Uh, each speaker will make a presentation, and we will have time for questions and answers uh, afterwards because I know you'll have a lot of them. Kristen. Good afternoon. I want to first start off by thanking President Elizabeth McNamara for her leadership. And uh, thanks to all of you for the important work that you do in your communities around the country to safeguard access to the ballot box. Uh, again, my name is Kristen Clark. I'm the President and Executive Director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, one of our nation's historic civil rights organizations. And while we are an organization that focuses on many civil rights issues, our work to defend the rights of all voters seeking to participate in our democracy is a core component of our work. And I want to take a moment uh, this afternoon to talk about the landscape uh, that we face with respect to voting rights. First, as has already been noted, this is the first presidential election cycle in more than 50 years without the full force of protections that have long been provided by the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act is our nation's most important federal civil rights law. And the 2013 ruling, which was issued almost three years ago, gut the heart of the Voting Rights Act. That provision, the Section 5 preclearance provision, has provided strong medicine to help prevent, block, and deter voting discrimination in many parts of our country. Since the Supreme Court's ruling, we have seen the resurgence of discriminatory voting changes in the very jurisdictions where Section 5 had been in place. We are now living through an era where we are experiencing discriminatory and burdensome photo ID requirements for voters, cuts on early voting opportunities, and purges of the voting rolls. Second, we are also moving into this election cycle at a moment where we saw the lowest levels of voter turnout that uh, we have ever seen in more than 70 years in our country. During the 2014 midterm election cycle, only 36.4% of eligible Americans turned out to vote. That number is shameful. 
An important question to ask is whether that low turnout rate is the direct result of the resurgence of discriminatory voting changes that we have seen in the wake of the Supreme Court's Shelby County ruling. Third, this is an election cycle in which we have seen more restrictions on the right to vote at the state level uh, that we have seen in more than 50 years. There are 17 states with new voting restrictions in place for the first time. Not just photo ID, we're talking about strict, burdensome, documentary proof of citizenship requirements for people who are seeking to register to vote. As a result, there are a tremendous number of cases that are currently being litigated in courts all around the country. And I want to highlight some of the gravest threats that we face. Texas is the poster child for voter disenfranchisement at this moment. <laughs> Among all the efforts around the country that we are seeing, none is more worse than Texas. On the day that the Supreme Court issued its Shelby County ruling, the Texas State Attorney General, on the very afternoon uh, following the Supreme Court's ruling, announced that he was moving forward with mandatory government-issued photo ID for voters. And so that means that unless you have a driver's license or a passport or a military ID card or a gun license, that you cannot vote in the state of Texas. A student ID is not going to cut it, but a gun license does. And let me tell you what's so problematic about the Texas law. There are 600,000 registered voters who were disenfranchised as a result of Texas's law. 600,000 people who had routinely gone out to vote, were eligible to vote, uh, who were rendered uh, disenfranchised as a result of that state's law. This is a law that has an impact on African Americans and Latinos and minorities and the elderly and students. This is a law that has an impact on poor people. 21% of eligible Texas voters with incomes under $20,000 lack photo ID. When you look at people in the income bracket between 100 and 150,000, they're only 2% uh, without qualifying ID. Texas photo ID laws are also sex is sexist. There are more than one million people with gun licenses in the state of Texas, and let me tell you what they look like. Of that 1 million, 6.6% of them are African American, 6.6%. And only 26% of them are women. So I'll say again, Texas's photo ID law is sexist. North Carolina. North Carolina also on the uh, other side of the uh, poster. Put in place a monster voting law. In North Carolina, they decided to do away with same-day registration. They decided to cut early voting opportunities. They decided to strike pre-registration opportunities for 16 and 17-year-olds. And we are fighting the battle in the courtroom now against North Carolina's efforts to turn the clock back. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? One, we need to champion a pro-democracy agenda and continue to push for universal suffrage. suffrage. We need more foot soldiers in this war. At the Lawyers Committee and in partnership with many civil rights organizations and many of you, we lead the nation's largest nonpartisan election monitoring effort, the Election Protection Program, 866 Our Vote. So far in 2016 alone, we've heard from tens of thousands of voters who have called to report problems that range from, I can't meet the photo ID requirement in my place and I want to vote, to the machines are malfunctioning at my polling site, to they've changed my polling site at the last minute, I never got notice, to they told me that they don't have ballots yet and to come back several hours later. We need more boots on the ground in this fight. We need to work to recruit volunteers 
We need to recruit young people and students and new Americans and new voters and new millennials and bring them into our efforts. We need to fight the racist and sexist voter suppression efforts that are unfolding around the country and make sure that we are lifting up and champion, uh, being champions of efforts that will promote broad voter access. And so what am I talking about? We need to be champions of same-day registration, champions for automatic voter registration, champions for early voting opportunities, and champions of restoration of voting rights for people with criminal records, for people who have paid their debt to society and are seeking a second chance and want to be reintegrated into their communities and want citizenship rights restored on them. There are 5.85 million people in this country who cannot vote today because of racist disenfranchisement statutes that are on the books in states all across our country. I want to thank Maryland for being a leader in the state of Maryland, in 2016, legislators overcame a gubernatorial veto and restored voting rights for people with criminal backgrounds in that state. There are 40,000 people today who can vote in 2016 because of the bold leadership of folks in the Maryland State Legislature. I want to thank and lift up the governor of Virginia who used broad executive powers to restore voting rights for people with criminal backgrounds uh, in that state. There are 200,000 people who can vote today because of the governor's bold efforts in that state. So as I close out, I want to remind ourselves about the road that we've traveled to get here and uh, remind ourselves about some of the warriors that have come before us. Folks like Fannie Lou Hamer. In the early 1960s, Fannie Lou Hamer learned that she had the right to vote after attending a civil rights meeting in her community. And upon learning this, she attempted to register. She took a literacy test that she failed twice in which citizens had to read and interpret parts of the Mississippi State Constitution, but she passed the third time and successfully registered. And although her registration efforts were successful, she faced violence at every turn from the KKK and other racist elements in her community. And in 1964, she spoke about civil rights issues at the Democratic National Convention and recounted her experiences, including the beatings that she had faced and endured. Hamer saw black suffrage as a way to improve African Americans' conditions in our country by allowing them to choose politicians that would effectively represent their interests. The work that Fannie Lou Hamer uh, performed uh, helped to lay the groundwork for us today. We are all Fannie Lou Hamer. So as I close out, I encourage you to carry forth her torch and carry forth the legacy of the work that she did to promote univer universal suffrage for all of us. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Arturo Vargas. Buenas tardes. <laughs> First, thank you, Elizabeth, for the invitation to be here. And I also look forward to working with your new CEO and uh, continuing the partnership that Naleo has long enjoyed with the League of Women Voters. The National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials is just a child compared to you. We celebrate 40 years today, uh, this year. We were founded by the late Congressman Edward R. Roybal, a true pioneer in himself, uh, to form a national network of political and community leaders to move forward a nonpartisan agenda to ensure that our community can fully participate in American democracy. The Naleo Educational Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and that's the entity with which we partner so much with your state leads, your local leads, 
and I am so humbled to have been, had our organization recognized by your lead in Los Angeles for the partnership that we have done together. Kristen laid out, I think, a very remarkable overview of the state of voting rights in our country. Voting rights are under attack. And the Shelby decision was more than just the first volley in that attack that we're enduring. Since 2012, 19 states have passed measures, either laws or impl implemented administrative changes that will directly affect nearly 900,000 Latino U.S. citizens in their ability to cast the ballot. Now, there are millions of Latinos who live in the states with these restrictions. But we did an analysis of how many Latinos actually will be touched and affected by these new laws and administrative changes. Kristen mentioned Texas. I eat Texas. <laughs> it must be something in the beef. <laughs> over, we calculate that over 750,000 Latinos who have voted in previous elections may not have the proper ID needed to vote on November 8, 2016. We are under attack in terms of our voting rights. And this is not even anticipating the administrative changes we saw that created the fiasco in Maricopa County, Arizona. So we too at Naleo are working hard to try to deal with this attack. First, I'll invite you to visit our website and to read the report that goes state by state and analyzes every single law and its impact directly on Latino voters. It's called Latino Voters at Risk, Assessing the Impact of Restrictive Voting Changes in Election 2016. Our website is naleo, N-A-L-E-O dot O-R-G. We also operate a national hotline, 888-V-E-Y-V-O-T-A. That means ve y vota, go and vote. It's an evergreen hotline. We operate it 12 months out of the year, Monday through Friday, and in the run-up to uh, November, it'll be every single day from 4 a.m. in Los Angeles, because that's 7 a.m. on the East Coast, until 8 a.m., 8 p.m. on the West Coast and we have bilingual workers staffing that hotline because we believe ultimately the only way to ensure the protection of an individual's voting rights is to ensure that individual is fully informed of their rights and responsibilities. But I would like to divert just a little bit today and not just talk about the impact that these restrictive voting laws and administrative practices have had on the Latino community and will continue to have until we restore the VRA to its full strength. And on that point, I will underscore, it is voting rights that has, in this country's history and tradition, been one of the issues that truly has been bipartisan. And we look for the leadership from the Republican and Democratic parties to get this job done and modernize the Voting Rights Act. But I'd like to speak about something a little different, about what is affecting the ability of Latinos to vote. And I am now convinced, well, first of all, these, all these restrictive voting rights laws, people have asked me, why now? Because we're making a difference. Because our people are voting. Because they're having an impact. Because those in the status quo of political power want to retard and stop and slow down the inevitable. But it won't happen by itself. Because there's also something happening in our political system that is keeping our people from voting. And it's not just this mischievousness that we're seeing throughout the country. It is, I believe, a, an inherent flaw in our political system 
that actively discourages people from voting. And I am very angry this year. And let me tell you as a Latino, I have a lot to be angry about. <laughs> and it's not about one of the presumptive nominees. Because in fact, I think that may actually serve a perverse effect on motivation in this election. I am angry because of the partisan manipulation of my community that I see every single presidential election cycle. And I am seeing it again in 2016. You may have heard of a $15 million investment to mobilize immigrant and Latino voters in three states. $15 million to mobilize Latino and immigrant voters in Florida, Nevada, in Colorado, because they're battleground states. I get it. If you want to win a national electoral college election, you need these states. So the Latinos who live in Florida, Nevada, and Colorado are going to get lots of attention. And the Latinos who live in California, and in Texas, and in New York, and in Illinois, and in New Jersey, and in New Mexico, because they're red and blue states, and because uh, supposedly the outcome in those states is already determined, are going to be ignored again. And we lament the fact that people don't come out and vote. People aren't stupid. If nobody goes to them and asks them for their vote, if nobody listens to your issues, and nobody speaks to your issues and what you care about in elections, and they don't call you, they don't knock on your door, they don't ask you for your engagement, you're not gonna go out and vote. Which is why in 2012, in an election eve poll, 67% of Latinos who voted said nobody ever contacted them about voting. But who gets all the attention? It's those swing state voters, so good for them. But what does it do to our political system? What we're seeing again this year is a money dump at the last minute to rile up all these voters in Florida, Colorado, and Nevada. And what do we tell them? This is the most important election of your lifetime. This is the time you have to vote. Just see, you vote this time, and your life is going to change. <laughs> well, you know what? That's what we said in 2000. That's what we said in 2004. That's what we said in 2008. That's what we said in 2012. And that's what we're going to say in 2020. We've got to stop lying to our people. Every election is important. <laughs> and so what happens? With this money dump at the last minute in these states, we rile everybody up, we get them all excited, we tell them, you got to go vote. They get lots of attention, they're convinced to register to vote, they go and vote, and they vote on November 8th, and on November 9th, all these donors go away. Because their partisan outcomes have been achieved at the expense of the Latino community. And then we wonder why people are cynical about our political system. So I suggest to you, we have a bigger fight. We need to fight this attack on our voting rights. But we also need to attack our political system that manip manipulates our voters for partisan outcomes, does not invest in civic engagement infrastructure over the long term, that tells people, just vote this one time and your life will change because I need this candidate to win, and doesn't tell people you need to vote because it's not about the next November, it's about the next generation. Thank you. Kristen? Good afternoon, everyone. And I, I would also like to thank the League for this great, wonderful partnership. You know, 
For API Vote, Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote, we're actually the baby. Uh, we've, we've only been around as an institution for about a decade. Um, but, you know, as we know with every election cycle, you know, the political landscape has changed, um, but that, a lot of it is really because of the changing demographics. And the Asian American Pacific Islander community really is providing that, um, that great color of what we're seeing this uh, landscape change. You know, for us, we're the, now the fastest growing population in the United States, but yet two thirds of our community are still first generation immigrants. And as a result, Anecdotally, we've heard that many times when we register new voters, they say, this is the first time anyone has ever asked me to register, or this is the first time anyone's ever talked to me about politics. Um, currently, right now, Asian American Pacific Islanders have the lowest voter registration rate. Um, but, you know, that goes back again because we haven't had the institutions and infrastructures. So we really look toward many times the league where you do have that, you have that name brand as the trusted institution. Many times the work that API Vote does is that our model is that we work with local nonprofits that are Asian American Pacific Islander focused and help them build a capacity and infrastructure and interest in doing voter registration and voter engagement work. But the first time that many, many of them have ever, uh, when we talked to them initially, they all say that the only thing that they know about voting is really what they've heard from the, from the league, women voters. So that's really a huge credit to all of you, especially with this new immigrant, immigrant population. But you know, I'm really excited for 2016 because this is really truly the largest mobilization effort that we've ever seen in the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Uh, we have nonprofit partners in 25 states that are ready with specific um, goals for voter registration and turnout. Um, but you know, language access continues to be an issue that we uh, need to address. Um, alone, just within our networks, uh, we are going to be translating materials into 14 different languages. You know, 75% of our community actually speak a second language, and 40% have difficulty with English. In our post-election poll in 2012, uh, we noted that limited English proficient voters' turnout is 9% lower than those who are English proficient. And we all know also with the voting rights laws, many times even though the law is there, it's not necessarily being uh, implemented correctly. So for instance, even though um, we had this one voter, Mrs. Bui, who's a Vietnamese American, who was all excited back in 2014 to go vote because she, you know, as a Vietnamese woman, she's, she came from a, um, a country where voting was not, just, it was a, it was, it was not a practice that was being done. And so when she became a um, United States citizen, she decided immediately that she wanted to go vote. So she learned from our partner about um, how you could get, bring someone to the polls to actually get some um, language assistance. So the day came when she went to go vote early, and you know, in Houston, by law, they are supposed to be providing language assistance in Vietnamese, and they did. But they also have the option, every voter has the option of bringing anyone of their choice. Originally, she wanted to bring her son to the election poll to actually have him help and assist her. She just felt more comfortable with her son assisting her. But he was actually turned away, and she was told that um, she would need to utilize the translator that they actually had provided. Also, like in Minnesota, you know, we had our nonprofit partner um, where they were ready to actually, they've had, leading up to the elections, had identified Hmong voters that wanted to be picked up, taken to the polls, and then um, provided language assistance. Um, one volunteer was turned away saying that you're only allowed to assist five people. So, you know, we had to go back and, you know, later on follow up with that because that's like an arbitrary type of uh, number that they came up with. So, you know, 
these these type of stories are things that we're starting to hear, but also, once again, with Asian American Pacific Islander voters who are new to this, and many times are first-time voters, they don't understand the, their rights. They don't understand that a scenario that they may be facing is actually illegal. Um, so there's a lot of education that needs to be um, done with that. In our most recent poll for the 2016 um, election, you know, we also found out that you know, 37% actually don't identify with a political party. And we know many times local elections are really done during the primary systems. So how can we actually explain and, and make sure our voters are being comfortable and understanding the, what this party system actually looks like and why we actually sometimes need to participate in that party system? Um, you know, we've also heard that 54% of our voters think that politicians don't care. And now also with this whole anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim rhetoric that we're hearing, um, our voters are also getting angry. And in our re re most recent poll, 43% said that they would change their vote just for the fact that um, anti a candidate was y utilizing anti-Muslim rhetoric or anti-immigrant rhetoric. And typically our voters are multi-issue voters, but this has been such a heated issue and something that they felt that impacts them tremendously that this is of uh, utmost importance to them. So, you know, with that, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and uh, we recognize that the Asian American Pacific Islander community is very diverse, but I think the dream of really becoming part of this um, American fabric is very much there. It's just that we really need the league's assistance and partnership on the local level to really help our institutions who are very new at this, um, who would love to actually understand how do we conduct a candidates forum? How can we get more assistance in, um, um, un you know, educating our community, our voters, about what type of assistance that they could actually provide. These are lessons that we have learned because API Vote, as with our partners, Asian American Advancing Justice, AJC, uh, coordinate the 888 API Vote Hotline. And so with that, we provide language assistance in Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Urdu, Hindi, and Bengali. This list has actually continued to expand as we've been bringing on new partners and new communities are entering into, um, um, into this fabric in terms of the work that we're actually doing. So I look forward to continuing this conversation and really uh, talking directly about where are some of the strategies that we could do and implement together. Thank you. Before I open, before I open this up for questions, um, I'd like to I'd like a question. I'd like to address a question to to the panel, uh, because I hear you loud and clear in terms of a the partisan manipulation of um, certain voting demographics, but also the importance of, of voting in every election. Uh, I live in Georgia. And our population is extremely diverse, and we are going to be one of those states that no one is going to pay attention to. And yet, in statewide elections, every, you know, the, the, the new demographics could make a difference. Um, this has been a frustration, I know, for everyone in league who believes, because we don't understand the importance, and sometimes the greater importance, of non-presidential elections. Any advice for us as to how we motivate and how we message the importance of particularly statewide wide elections where the strength of the full um, demographic cohort can be brought to bear and really make some changes? Uh, and I will open this up to anyone or all three of you who would like to answer. Well, I'd like to... Um respond to at least part of that question. One, we are paying attention to what's happening in Georgia, and it's Oh, a mess. I know you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hancock County, Georgia, is a place where local election officials decided that they're gonna clean up the registration rolls, and they undertook a purge of 20% of registered voters from the town of Sparta in Georgia, 
And we looked, when we looked closely to see who they struck, we found that the vast majority of them were African American. We don't have Section 5, so we filed suit, and that lawsuit is playing out today. We are going to fight to defend the rights of people who are legitimately registered to voters, long-time uh, African Americans uh, in the town of Sparta who want to participate in the political process there. Macon Bibb County, Georgia. Local election officials thought it was a bright idea to move a polling site out of the black community into a local sheriff's office. <laughs> We fought, uh, we arm wrestled with them, and then finally we invoked a, a, a procedure in state law that's not used often, a petition procedure, and we were able to gather enough petitions working with advocates on the ground to push back and get the election officials to move the site out of the sheriff's office and back to a black church uh, in the black community there. So, Georgia, Georgia is keeping us real busy. But I'm glad you asked this question. You know, there is increased attention all around our country right now on the criminal justice crisis that we face in so many communities around our country. Police brutality, excessive use of force, the death of unarmed civilians, too many of them African American men and boys. And I think that if you care about criminal justice and the crisis of mass incarceration in our country, you have to care about the right to vote. Mayors, elected mayors are the ones who install police chiefs, who oversee so many of these problematic police departments. Sheriffs are elected officials in many communities across our country. And DAs, district attorneys tasked with the responsibility of making decisions about whether to hold police chiefs accountable are elected officials. So I think that there is a new and different way for us to talk about why the right to vote is so important. Yes, it's important because there are many people who have fought and bled for us to have the right to vote, but we've got to translate this right into the issues that are playing out and plaguing so many of our communities right now, and criminal justice, I would put at the top of that list. Thank you. Anyone else? Or, or so, um, I, just, I also wanted to note that, you know, especially with the Asian Pacific Islander community, they're first time voters, or maybe they've only gone through one election cycle. So as a result, their voting history is what is called a low propensity voter. Um, so many times campaigns, when they're looking at, once again, targeting voters and they have um, XYZ amount of funding, they're focusing on those that are voting on a regular basis and ignoring this new base of voters. So this is where um, what we found is like in 2015 when we uh, were working here in Virginia in the local elections, we sent out mailers and we did phone banking to our uh, base of voters. And we got a lot of calls on our hotline saying, oh, until I got your mailer, I didn't know there was an election, right? So this goes back again that we need to focus on these new uh, voters and because we know that the campaigns are not paying attention to them. So uh, we really rely on other partners to help us um, touch that. And you know, we also recognize that for communities that are limited English proficient, maybe we can't translate everything, but can we be creative, such as in Seattle and Oregon, where they host ballot parties in Korean and Vietnamese and Chinese, so that way they actually go through the ballot in language and they have a community and, and, and they can learn from one another on that. So this is an issue that we have been very much struggling with at Naleo about what we call the great unengaged. So there are 55 million Latinos in the United States today. Of them in November, 27.3 million will be eligible to vote. That's because they'll be at least 18 years of age and a United States citizen. And by the way, the balance of those who are not eligible to vote isn't because they're immigrants, it's because they're children. Of those 20.73 million eligible to vote, we're projecting a turnout of 13.1. Okay, on the one hand, that's a historic number, the largest number of Latinos ever to vote in an election. I also know it's less than half of our potential. So we've been doing research into why. 
why the great unengaged? And there's two things that I've learned from that process. And this is focus groups and polling and talking to people and trying to really uh, do demographic analysis of who the great unengaged are. Under. There's two things I've learned. First of all, number one, it is not apathy. Apathy means you don't care. I've yet to meet a single person who doesn't care about their child or who doesn't care about the streets that they live on and how, whether or not they're safe or not, or whether or not their son or daughter who's fighting in Afghanistan is going to come back, or whether they'll come back from a nightclub. We care. The problem is we don't believe the political system is going to make a change in our lives. And that's the heavy lift we need to do. We need to restore faith in our political system, and it takes hard work. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take what you've been doing. It's reaching people one by one. And it's expensive. It's resource. Uh, allocation is... And campaigns are lazy. As Christine said, they're only going to go after the likely voters and ignore everybody else. So we have to hold our own political systems and leadership and candidates and campaigns accountable about how they invest and engage in our communities. You. If you have any questions for the panel, please come to the mics. Hello. Uh, I'll start with microphone too. Thank you. Norma Rodriguez Reyes from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, in terms of the Latinos not voting, if I've heard that once, I've heard it a million times. And I was just wondering if Naleo has done an economic analysis mm -hmm. on all of the candidates that are running for office and how much they have invested in the Latino community in their neighborhood. Because if I am not mistaken, it's less than one cent. And it's always two weeks before election. Thank you. Uh, we have not done that analysis. And it's actually one we need to do. Because unless we actually can show them how they are ignoring and not investing in our community, we can't make that case. So yes, we, it's exactly the analysis we need to do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to microphone three. Hi, Marge Nichols with the Pasadena Area League. And I'd like to ask Barbara uh, to comment on the recent Supreme Court decision uh, rejecting the notion that Samoans can be American citizens. They're born in American territory. They have no other citizenship. They've never had any other citizenship. And the Supreme Court upheld the notion that they may not be citizens and they may not vote or hold office. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, I have not necessarily um, kept up with the complexities of that issue, but um, my understanding also from um, our partners in the Pacific Islander community, that is actually a lot more complex than that. And so it wasn't necessarily even a cut and dry in regards to everyone um, in, from that region actually also wanted it. So unfortunately, I could always follow up with you more about that, but unfortunately I don't have the details right now. Thank you. Uh, microphone four. Yes, my name is Pat Griffith and I'm from Seattle King County. I have a question on a little different tack. And I know we have some uh, caucuses later on on um, addressing the needs of the transgender community. Uh, most of our voter registration forms have you mark an X for male or female. How do we address uh, some of these issues? <laughs> Kristen, can you, can? <laughs> I can address that. You no, know, I, I, I'm glad you raised, we're all looking at each other saying, good question. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very um, good question. Yeah, right, this is the, the new frontier. And I think, you know, we are encountering uh, a lot of the questions, the important questions that need to be asked uh, right now for the very first time. So I'm, I'm glad that this was raised and I think that it's something that we need to put our heads together about and, and think about what are the, the recommendations, the smart recommendations that we should be putting forward to election officials. 
I thought, I thought about this the other day when I got um, an invitation from the White House. Um, and it was, you know, the day after the announcement about the litigation unfolding now in North Carolina, and it, you know, it asked me to check check off a box on gender, and it was just male or female as the the option. So I think this is an important question that has implications in many, many different contexts. Thank you. Microphone five. Yes, my name is Michelle Dennis, Los Angeles. Um, I am transgendered, and the answer to that question is other. Um, major universities across the country are using that format with an opportunity to write in. It's a very simple fix. But my question uh, to the panel is, um, when an election represents 33%, one-third roughly, of the registered voter, the voters, the outcome could be legal. But the more fundamental question is, is the outcome legitimate? Um, it's time, I think, that the league start raising this more global question. And it, it, it's going to entail rethinking our stand about voters' rights. If elections are declared illegitimate because they re represent less than 50% of the registered voters voting and jurisdictions get penalized for that, then we have a new ball game. But I would, I would just urge, this is a... a, a I can't imagine. Is there a question? Yeah, the question is, <laughs> have you thought about this? Great. <laughs> Stumped you again, right? Because it's under the percentage. Right, so you all may be conducting business and, and it requires a quorum, right? That Correct. you have at least a majority. Hey, amen, I, I hear you. When you look at the United States and how we measure up against other industrialized nations, we are always at the bottom of the list. And uh, I hear you calling into question the legitimacy of election, electoral outcomes when we have 10%, 20%, 30% of, of voters participating. And I think you, you raise an interesting way for us to think about how we can incentivize election officials to not throw up barriers, but to do the real important work that they should be doing to make sure that eligible people in their communities are turning out, are able, to successfully cast a ballot on election day. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone six. My name is Grace Shemaine. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Texas. And we are working very hard uh, with the Be a Texas Voter campaign to coordinate the nonprofits and other, other organizations in Texas that have client contact to try to get them to also promote voting. Do you have any messaging for your different groups uh, that you think we should use to try to encourage nonprofits to participate with us? Encourage nonprofits. Nonprofits, Grace, or, or voters? Non the, there's only uh, nonprofits. I want the nonprofits to start promoting voting. Gotcha. So, so it's collaboration. Gotcha. Uh, and you're from Texas. I just want to give a shout out to the. Houston lead of the League of Women Voters for the terrific work we're doing together to register people at naturalization ceremonies there. Wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. I think this is one where we need good uh, education to the nonprofit community about what you can do mm -hmm. to engage the public in civic engagement. Many nonprofits shy away from voter engagement because they believe it is either too political, it will endanger their funding. Uh, so we need to do a better job of informing the nonprofit field about what they can do okay. uh, so that they can get over the fear that they may be somehow risking either their nonprofit status or their funding because they may be perceived as engaging in political activities when in fact at C3s we can encourage people to participate. Right. Thank you. Microphone one. Uh, Kelly Persons, League of Women Voters of Georgia. Sorry, not a question, more of a comment. Wanted to take an opportunity to thank uh, Naleo and AAIP. Uh, in Georgia, we work directly with your partners on the ground, Galeo, Asians American Advancing Justice, and they are an integral part of what we do, whether it's at the naturalization ceremonies or at the election boards. So I just wanted to express how, how deeply in tune we are in Georgia with all the things that we have going on. So thank you and thank you for being here. Thank you, Kelly. 
and shamelessly thank you for all the work you're doing too at naturalization ceremonies. Um, microphone two. Hi, I'm Patricia Carter from uh, Cleveland, Greater Cleveland uh, League. I have a question and uh, concern. Uh, Mr. Vargas, I reach out to the, uh, the organization on campus at Cleveland State University, and it's called Latinos Unidos. And basically, when they graduate, I try to get them to register, but they decline. How can I improve my reach to them? Yeah. So what thing I would uh, be careful about is don't assume that because they're turning 18 that they're eligible to vote. Because one of the things that we have been working very closely with our friends who are developing automatic voter registration systems, like our former national president, Alex Padilla, the Secretary of State of California, is do n yeah, right? Is let's not inadvertently register somebody who's not yet eligible to vote because they're not a citizen. So we need to be careful about that. Uh, but I think what we need to do is not wait till somebody turns 18. You know, just, just imagine, imagine if we did our work today to encourage people to vote in the election of 2032. What would that look like? For one, we would know that there will be 17.1 million more <laughs> Latinos eligible to vote in the year 2032. And you know where they are? They're in our classrooms. <clears throat> Let's reach them as young and teach them that. And I'm, what I'm suggesting is that it's a long-term strategy that we need to do to work with our youth as children, as young people, so that when they turn 18 or they graduate from college, it's something we all do, is register to vote and vote. Thank you. We have time for, we have time for one more question. I'm going to go to microphone three. I'm Lolly Watt with the League of Women Voters in Wilmette, in Illinois. And I'm an adult immigrant, naturalized American, bilingual in English and Bengali. And I would urge the League to really look at bringing naturalized Americans into our organization in a much broader way, not just to look at us as people who we need to do outreach to to get them to vote, but make them integral to our organization. With that, I have a question about outreach to uh, Americans of Asian origin. Our community really has a split. We have some people who are low English, low proficiency, all of these things. We have another huge group who are extremely active in Silicon Valley, extremely highly educated. And I was wondering if there are any initiatives underway to use the amazing technological skills of our community, or half of our community, to do outreach to the other half and help them bridge that gap. Uh, because one of the things I find is people are woefully un, um, trained about how the political system works. When you become a citizen, you have no idea what's local government, what's state government, what's national government, what is any of this about? So can we bridge that with technology? Thank okay. you. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of our community is, is actually online, and so they rely on ethnic press. Um, because it, it's actually a lot more affordable and it's wide-reaching, um, especially with the different languages that we are also working with. Now, in regards to um, those that are from Silicon Valley or those who are more limited English proficient, actually, we found that their voter participation rate and interest is actually just as horrible. Uh, so those in the Silicon Valley, we actually need to do a lot of work in, in regards to making them also understand how politics also impacts their lives because I think there's also a thinking for some of them there that, you know, I'm, I'm creating my, my tech industry and I'm just doing what I need to do and, and nothing else will impact it, so. Thank you and thank you all for the good questions. Thank you all very much for taking time to speak to us about this. This is incredibly important and thank you for being our partners.